Good morning. It's so good to be with you today. I have waited all week to get to be with you again. I'm glad that you're able to uh, be here. Many of you in person, many others uh, online. So glad that, uh, that you're with us today. May God bless us as we study his word together. Let's take a look again today at some of the things that Jesus taught from the book of Luke. Uh, one of the four books in the Bible that tells us about the life and ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus our Lord. We've been working our way through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, not every passage, but a few select passages. Let's start today in Luke chapter 9 and verse 18. Luke 9, verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. And still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in, the glo in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. This conversation was a turning point in Jesus' relationship with his disciples. In one way, it was a glorious moment. The glory in this text is in the disciples' recognition of who Jesus is, that he is God's Messiah, the Christ. Both of those words mean God's anointed one, God's chosen king of Israel. The disciples had been with Jesus for a while now, maybe uh, between one and two years is kind of our best guess, and they have gotten to know him in more intimately than anyone else who follows him. And they are beginning to understand that Jesus is more than a great teacher. He is more than a prophet. He is the one God sent to be ruler of his people. He is God's Messiah. It's a wonderful and powerful thing when you begin to realize who Jesus is. It opens up a glorious door into a whole new life. This last week, I heard a recording of the Christian apologist William Lane Craig. He's one of my favorites. I like to listen to his, uh, his defense of Christianity. He was talking about how he came to Christ. He didn't grow up in a church, but as a young man, he met some Christians his age. They connected him with the church, and he started reading the Bible for himself, and he discovered Jesus. Now, he had heard about Jesus, but in reading about Jesus, he discovered him in a whole new way. And he says he just loved Jesus. He was enthralled with who Jesus is, and he became a follower of Jesus. I can relate to his story because I, too, am amazed and delighted by Jesus. I love who Jesus is. The more I get to know him, the more I love who he is. And maybe you who are here or who are listening uh, online today... Maybe you are just getting to know Jesus. Maybe you're curious about Jesus. But I know many of you are here today with us because you too love Jesus. Like Peter, you believe Jesus is God's Messiah and you want to know him better and you want to follow him. That's the glory in this text. Jesus, his identity as God's Messiah. The surprise... The shocker in this text is that Jesus, the Messiah, must suffer many things, must be rejected, and must be killed. 
That was not what ancient Jews expected would happen to their Messiah. They thought he would come and conquer their Roman overlords, make Israel an independent and strong nation, and this new king would rule Israel as a mighty and absolutely godly king and make Israel the model for the rest of the world. But Jesus prophesies that he, God's Messiah, will suffer and die. He's predicting, of course, his death on the cross. So then, the challenge in Jesus' teaching here is this. If you want to follow Jesus the Messiah, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. He's our Messiah, He's our King. We have to be ready to suffer and even to die for him because he suffered and died for us. Which means there's one attitude we absolutely have to have if we're going to follow Jesus. It's a cross-centered attitude, meaning that it's built around how Jesus went to the cross and gave up his life for us. And it is built around the understanding that to follow Jesus, we have to take up our cross daily and follow him. A cross-centered attitude is an attitude of selflessness. That in following Jesus, we set ourselves aside to follow him, to serve God, and to bless other people. An attitude of selflessness. For the rest of this lesson, I want to talk about what Jesus says that cross-centered attitude looks like. First, from verse 23, Jesus explains that if you follow him, then we don't get to be in control of our own lives anymore. When we follow Jesus, he becomes the authority in our lives. He becomes our king. In denying ourselves and taking up our cross we release control of our lives to God. We have to deny ourselves. We have to tell ourselves no to what we want and instead pursue what God wants in our lives. In one of our readings just a minute ago, Jesus modeled this for us when he said to God in prayer, take this cup from me, yet not what you will, and not what I will, but what you will. Taking up our cross daily means we will accept whatever difficulties and challenges we may face each day for the sake of Christ, and we will serve him no matter what it costs us. And following Jesus means going where he leads, doing the kinds of things that he did, pursuing the will of God in everything. So, for example, let's take something Jesus taught in our text last week from Luke 6, verses 27 and 28, just as an example of how we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. In that text last week, Jesus said, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you. Now, let's say that you have an enemy. I hope you don't, but let's say you did. Someone who's out to get you, someone who treats you badly, someone who simply hates you. Denying yourself might mean giving up any right to get revenge on this person. You might have every good reason to get revenge, but denying yourself means that you will not try for the sake of Christ because he's told you to love your enemy. Taking up our cross might mean loving this person even when it's hard to do so. It's a great burden to try to love someone who is unloving toward you, who is not worthy of your love. It's a great burden, but that is a cross that we're willing to bear for Jesus. We love this person even when it's so hard. Following Jesus might mean loving your enemy just as Jesus loved his enemies. Because even on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And so we set ourselves aside And we do the will of God in obedience to Jesus. We deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And the blessing when we follow Jesus this way 
is that by losing control of our lives to God, we actually save our lives. God makes us better people. He forgives our sins. He makes us his children, and he promises his children eternal life. And so by losing control of our lives to God, we actually save our lives. Next, in verse 26, Jesus calls us to set aside our pride and be people of courage. He warns us that if we're ashamed of him and his words now, he will be ashamed of us when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Now, no one likes to suffer. But if you're ashamed to suffer for Jesus after he suffered for you, then you simply cannot follow him. In the very early church, almost 2,000 years ago, people in the Roman Empire mocked Christians for following this man who suffered and then died on a cross. They, they laughed because that was just the most ridiculous thing. People who die on a cross are weak. And Christians followed a man who was obviously weak. He had died on a cross. But Jesus calls us not to be ashamed of him or of his words. Don't be ashamed of his weakness. And do not be ashamed to be weak yourself. Because in becoming weak, Jesus entrusted himself to God. And God raised him from the dead with divine power. And so in taking on an attitude of selflessness and setting ourselves aside, letting, us, letting ourselves become weak for Jesus, we courageously open ourselves to the overwhelming power of God that raised Jesus from the dead so that God can work within us. It takes courage to stand unashamed for Jesus unashamed of his suffering, unashamed to suffer for Jesus. Yet if we stand boldly for him, Jesus will also stand boldly for us when he comes again. And he will not come in weakness, but in divine glory. Just a little later in chapter 9, Jesus prophesies about his suffering again. And notice what the disciples do right after Jesus gives this second Prophecy, because it gives Jesus opportunity to teach them some more about what it means to have a cross-centered attitude as we follow him. Let's pick up in verse 43, the middle of the verse. Luke 9, 43. <clears throat> While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Let's go just a little further. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. Let's go a little further. Look at what happens next. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call, down, call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Let's go just a little further. One more section. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, 
Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus predicts his suffering again. This is the second time he does this in Luke. And then Luke describes this sequence of events <clears throat> in which Jesus' disciples and some potential disciples repeatedly demonstrate that they not only don't yet understand what will happen to Jesus, but they also don't yet understand the cross-centered attitude that we have to have in order to follow Jesus. In verses 46 to 48, the disciples argue about which of them is the greatest. Now here Jesus has just predicted his suffering, and they're arguing about who of them is the greatest. They're probably thinking that by following the Messiah, they're positioning themselves for positions of glory and authority. And each of them wants the highest positions when Jesus comes into his new kingdom. But Jesus' kingdom isn't like that. So he teaches his disciples that the person who is the greatest is the person who is the least. To be great in God's kingdom, you have to set aside all your pride and humble yourself and take the lowest position. One excellent way to do that is just what Jesus models here. He takes a little child and welcomes him or her. Jesus taught his disciples to set aside their quest for greatness and instead welcome little children. When you humble yourself to welcome a little child, you welcome Jesus. And when you welcome Jesus, you welcome God. When you set yourself aside, set aside all your pride, all your aspirations for greatness, and you welcome someone who is small or weak or powerless, Someone who's not going to improve your profit margin. Someone who can't pay you back when you do something for them. When you do this, you honor Jesus. Because that's what Jesus did for us when we were sinful, when we were small, when we were weak. And so when you help a sick person, or when you give a gift to help someone who's struggling, just to help them get by, or when you welcome an outsider into your home, or when you welcome an outsider into the church, when you welcome a little child, you set yourself aside, you set aside your pride, and you truly follow Jesus, who set himself aside to serve us and to suffer for us and to die for us. In verses 49 and 50, just when Jesus teaches his disciples, for it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. The apostle John immediately speaks up. In fact, in the Greek it says, he answered Jesus by saying that he and the disciples saw someone driving out demons in Jesus' name, someone who is not one of the official disciples, not part of their group, and they tried to stop him because he wasn't one of them. But Jesus tells them not to stop, them, stop him because he's not against them. Again, the disciples are acting out of pride. They want their group to be in charge. They know their group is the one that belongs to Jesus. They ought to be in charge. They want to be the center of attention, have all the control and influence. But this other man was doing good in Jesus' name. Don't stop him. Don't stop someone who is not against you who is doing good in the name of Jesus. Again, Jesus was teaching his disciples not to act out of pride, but to take on a cross-centered attitude of selflessness, which sometimes means lowering ourselves to welcome little children. And in this case, meant setting aside their pride in their group and supporting the good work that someone else was doing. And again, in verses 51 to 56, the next event in this sequence of responses to Jesus speaking about his suffering. 
Jesus teaches his disciples humility when he rebukes James and John for wanting to call fire down from heaven to destroy a Samaritan village when its people refused to welcome Jesus. Jesus rebukes them because followers of Jesus are not to destroy their enemies. God forbid. May God even forbid us from using that kind of language. We're here to save every person we can in Jesus' name. Jesus calls us, therefore, to be gracious to those who oppose us. He said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Jesus showed this sort of humility for us when he gave his life for us, and he calls us to show this kind of humility for others. And in this moment, he doesn't bring any punishment down on that Samaritan village. He simply rebukes his disciples, and they go on to another village. Jesus responds graciously. This is part of how we live out a cross-centered attitude, setting ourselves aside for the sake of Jesus, who set himself aside for us. And then Jesus, in our, the last section of our text, in conversations with three potential disciples, calls his followers to full, absolute devotion to the kingdom of God. Following Jesus may cost us the comforts of life, as Jesus warns one man in verses 57 and 58. This man wants to follow Jesus. He'll follow Jesus wherever Jesus goes. But Jesus warns him that he doesn't even always have a bed to sleep in at night. And so before this man commits to following Jesus, he needs to think about whether he can accept being homeless and uncomfortable for Jesus. <clears throat> a lot of missionaries have given up the comforts of American life to serve God in other countries that are far less comfortable than our own. A lot of faithful Christians right here in our own country have made themselves less comfortable than they might have been so that they could devote more of their resources to the purposes of God's kingdom. They set themselves aside. They set their comfort aside for the sake of Jesus. Following Jesus has to come before even the most important family obligations. The second man here, in verses 59 and 60, wants to bury his father before he follows Jesus. Well, that was a very important uh, obligation in their culture, to give your parents a good and honorable burial. It showed your love for them and your respect for them. Maybe his father had recently died. Maybe his father was getting near uh, that time. We don't know. But either way, Jesus says... Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Nothing, not even family, can come before following Jesus. And to the third man in verses 61 and 62, Jesus says that no one who looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The man wanted to follow Jesus. He just wanted to go say goodbye to his family. But once you start following Jesus, there can be no looking back. No yes, but if we're going to follow Jesus. If Jesus says, follow me, and if you're going to follow him, you can't say, yes, Lord, but there are no yes, buts when following Jesus. Jesus gave everything for us when he died for us on the cross. If you're going to follow Jesus, you, you have to give everything to him. Now, if you are going to follow Jesus, you might still get to have a great bed. That's a blessing. You might still be able to go and bury your father or do whatever your family needs you to do for them. You might still be able to go and say goodbye for, to your family. But you have to be ready to give all of that up for the sake of following Jesus. God's kingdom has to come absolutely first. Following Jesus requires full devotion, which means we have to set ourselves aside and pursue the purposes and the work of God in our lives. We have to take on that cross-centered attitude of selflessness, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus, because Jesus took on that same attitude for us. If we can accept the challenge of following Jesus and take on the cross-centered attitude of selflessness that Jesus was trying to teach to his disciples in these texts, 
If we can absorb the shock of recognizing that we follow a man who suffered and died and that following him may mean suffering, our suffering for him too, then we enter into the glory of knowing and following Jesus, God's Messiah. Because after Jesus suffered, God raised him from the dead and exalted him to be King of kings and Lord of lords. And one day Jesus is going to come again in unprecedented glory. If we live with a cross-centered attitude and daily deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus whom we love so much, whom we delight in, then when he comes, we will share in his glory forever. As we wait for that day, God is transforming us daily to be more and more like Jesus. Better people, filled with the peace that comes from knowing God, powerful to bless people and to serve in God's kingdom for his glory and for our great joy. So as we wait for that day when Jesus will come again in glory, may the Lord help us this week to keep a cross-centered attitude and daily be true followers of Jesus. And if you follow Jesus today, may God bless you and give you strength. Let's pray together. Our God, we honor you today. We are gathered together in person and online to worship you and to praise you and give you thanks and to recommit ourselves to you. And we ask, dear Lord, that you would help us to live out the attitude of Christ, that cross-centered attitude of selflessness, that we would set ourselves aside and follow you whatever the cost and wherever you lead us. Teach us, dear Lord, to deny ourselves, to say no to ourselves, to take up our cross and follow. Teach us, O oh God, to welcome little children and anyone who is weak or who is left out uh, or who uh, is lonely. Lord, help us uh, not to seek um, the, um, the benefit of, of our group or the esteem of our group, but, uh, but the benefit of your kingdom. Help us, Lord, not to seek to destroy, but only to save and to build up. Dear God, help us to truly follow you when, it, when it's uncomfortable for us, when we have to give up something that's important to us, uh, when, it, when your uh, will for us conflicts with what our family wants from us. In all of this, Lord, help us to follow you with full devotion. Lord, we pray for one another. We pray for ourselves and for our church today. We ask that you would work powerfully within us to do whatever it is you have in mind to do this week. We pray, dear God, that you would guide us in everything. We pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to keep the covenant, the commitment that we have made uh, to you based on your covenant with us. Thank you so much for Jesus, who is our model and our inspiration and our Lord. We praise you today, dear God, in Jesus' name. Amen.